This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 819, recorded on Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. What you should know about beavers. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with blobs, femme fatales, and beavers. But first, don't forget about the Twist DTNS crossover, April 17th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. You don't miss it. Make sure it's on your calendar. Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. For the past four years, the Environmental Protection Agency has been the worst enemy of, well, the environment. Denial of global warming mass purges of research scientists, repeals of land, air, and water pollution regulations, abandonment of federally protected nature areas, and an odd attempt to get the auto industry to abandon their investment in cleaner emissions, which many of the auto companies rejected. They completely rejected this plan, announcing they would stick to the higher standard California regulations. They were then investigated by the Department of Justice under antitrust laws because not giving people an option to pollute more toxic exhaust out of their tailpipes is exactly what antitrust laws are for. Only no, that's not what antitrust laws are for. And so, yes, the investigation went nowhere. But yes, the auto industry was investigated by the U.S. federal government for wanting to make cleaner emitting cars. And there was also a massive reduction in on-site inspections of industry by the EPA. And all the while, a pool of radioactive sewage was building up in Florida. Also in Florida, a phosphate plant that closed 20 years ago began leaking. Threatening fish populations, seagrass, aquifers of drinking water had forced people to evacuate their homes and could bring about an epic red tide of toxic algae into Tampa Bay. Because environmental regulations, who needs them? But now at least there's some good news. The global warming page is back on the EPA website. While that's just a small step, science is being restored to the Science Advisory Board of the EPA in the form of research scientists. Yes, those folks are replacing dozens of political appointees legally placed there by the previous administrators, who I can only imagine start every conversation while at the Science Advisory Board with, I'm not a research scientist, but the way I see it, dot, dot, dot. So, to the incoming class of EPA advisor applicants, we say, please take your job seriously. We know you will, but seriously, take it serious. Because the air we breathe, the water we drink, is almost as important as This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back. We made it through another week, everyone. Congratulations on seven Earth rotations. <laughs> nice. Wow, you're very accomplished for just making it. So we've traveled. We have really been through time and space. Now it's. It's International Beaver Day. Did you know that? Everyone with a calendar would know that. That's right. If you have a twist calendar, you would know. So put that on your calendar for this year, for next year's, to get yourself a twist calendar, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. But, yes, so tonight, today, we are going to be talking about beavers. We've got an interview coming up with Ben Goldfarb, and... Are very excited about this. I also have stories about new physics, maybe. <gasps> Involves magnetism. Magnetism. Oh. Yes. I've also got um I have also got a story about the physics of raindrops. Because raindrops are mm. just they're wonderful. And 
if you can make it all the way to the very end of the show, I've got some brain glue for you. Mm. Brain glue to hold your brain all together. Yeah, that's after. important when I'm yeah. losing it. Yeah. Yes, I've got that for you. Justin, what did you bring? I have got a Norwegian blob mystery solved. Blobs. Great. I love solutions. Uh, yeah. Uh, tattoo, some sort of biosensor tattoo thing. You can just get this little thing patched in there and then you have a sensor in your body. Sweet. Also, uh, a better battery for the future. Something that might give uh, lithium batteries run for the money. Hmm. On the horizon. Could be interesting. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Uh, well, I have a couple of stories about COVID, not in the animal corner, just at the top of the show, but they're actually kind of heartwarming and fun. So that's oh, okay. interesting. And then I also, in the animal corner, I have cone oh, no. snails and fireflies. We love both of these things. Yes. Cone snails and their venom, especially. Yes, it's good, it's good stuff. We got a medicine cabinet full of cone snail venom, and we're going to talk more about that later. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, everyone, as you're settling in for the show, I just want to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, we are available on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitch, at Twist Science, and... You can find us just about any podcast platform that's out there. Look for This Week in Science. Our website is twist.org. Now it's time for the science. New physics! New physics! Every time we hear new physics, it's like, really? But I, nobody's It's annoying new. because it always replaces the old physics. It turns out all the physics that we were working with was all trash. It's no. all fake no. physics trash. The had standard to throw it all model. Out. The standard model. How many it's, times have we had to great. throw that out? Actually, no. None. None. Never. Never. Like, really, <laughs> the standard model has stood the test of time for about 100 years and yeah. doing great. However, there is some new research that was just released about uh, subatomic particles. Anti-muons, not even <gasps> muons, but anti-muons. It's the opposite of the muons. And they're actually using anti-muons because they're easier to create than it is to create the muons, but they act exactly the same. So it's like, hey, you can be a stand-in, right? You're like the double. You're the, the dark side double, the anti-muon. But this experiment that has just produced data, the Muon G2 experiment at Fermilab in Batavia, Illinois. Researchers have been waiting for the data analysis to come out. They've been shooting muons around, trying to get them to collide with things, trying to detect these anti-muons to be able to figure out what collisions they came from, so what created them. And in the process of putting them through their accelerations and doing this stuff. This was a blinded study. There was a calculation that was held in an envelope and kept away from all the researchers, all the physicists working on this experiment, so nobody would be biased by the potential result of this calculation. So it's kind of like, I, I don't know, it, it makes me think of other physics, quantum physics experiments, except this is particle physics. It's not, it doesn't exist until it does exist. Any I was case. picturing more like uh, the amazing Karnak, which is nobody's going to remember. It was an ancient Johnny Carson routine where he would hold an envelope up to his head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that You could imagine that also. <laughs> it's either Schrodinger's cat or the amazing Karnak yeah. of physics. <laughs> These researchers at the Muon uh, G2 experiment, uh, they produced results today that gave a statistical measure of 4.2 sigma agrees with earlier results from a Brookhaven National Lab experiment as well that suggest that there's a little wobble to these anti-muons, that magnetic fields are influencing them in a way that was unexpected. And so these particles are being affected by something and they don't know what. And so they think at this 4.2 sigma, combining the two experiments together, they've got this not quite five sigma result. And five sigma is like, that's where physicists are like, this is, this is it. We know this is a good result. It's like one in 350 million 
chance. If it's six sigma, it's even better. This experiment, they've only analyzed 6% of the data so far. So they think that this result could become even clearer with more analysis and more time. But the question is, what is making the anti-muons wiggle? What's affecting them? Are there other particles that have not been predicted that exist? And that is the question that people are, an- are asking. Does this mean there is something missing from the standard model? And physicists are very excited about it. So I realize physics is not my strong suit. Okay. And it's, right. a lot of it's kind of keeps still confusing to me. But I'm just asking here because I feel yeah. like this is a constant thing on the show. That it's always like, hey, there's this thing we don't understand. Let's invent a new particle, basically, to explain it, right? And so it's just kind of adding in here. But at a certain point, is it possible that if you just stepped all the way back to the beginning and started over, uh, you could come up with a completely different explanation for how the world works? (laughs) Instead of just putting all these kind of band-aids on everywhere. Okay, but let's add this in and let's add that in. Right. So there is a controversial paper that did away with this calculation that uh, that the Brookhaven experiment and this G2 experiment were looking for, trying to trying to calculate more accurately. And the controversial paper, it elegantly gets rid of the need for these extra particles. But in its solution, it causes more problems. So this is so this is where the balancing of experimental and theoretical physics comes in that the 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 theorists are like, okay, we're going to do the math and we're going to try and come up with new ideas. And then the experimentalists have to go and see what works and what doesn't work and try these things out. So now somebody needs to do more muon magnetism experiments to confirm this even further or to break it and say that it doesn't work. And people need to do experiments that will deal with those issues that the controversial paper sets up. So it's just setting up more things to do in science. Yeah, but I don't think if you, I think because of the way these balances work, if you did go back to the very beginning, it would end up coming out fairly similar because of the way we look at the world using math and physics and the way that we explain things through those lenses. Yeah, and also I'd say that most of the real challenges or changes or you're saying band-aids where we've had to reevaluate stuff just comes yeah. from being able to see better. Mm-hmm. You know, having having better technology, having accelerators for the first time has allowed us to actually yeah. just find stuff that was already predicted, uh, but also make some new progress. So Yeah. Uh, progress. Yeah. Is there new physics? We don't know. But this is a tantalizing result. It's Ooh. exciting. And it doesn't sound like it's new physics. It sounds yeah. like it's just adding to the, mm-hmm. the An update, if you will. <laughs> yes, updating the particles. standard model 2.0, possibly. Yeah. All right. Tell me about these sensors that you're that you're excited about, Justin. Oh, uh, let's see where I put this. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Professor Karsten Soenschitzkinson. Uh, research uh, researcher at, at uh, Johannes Gutenberg University has been using gold nanoparticles as sensors to detect tiny amounts of proteins in microscopic flow cells for many years. These uh, nanoparticles can actually act like uh, you're saying antennas for light. So they react to alterations of the surrounding molecules by changing color. And that can actually that's how they sort of operate as a sensor. That color change indicates when something that they're looking for is or isn't passing over the sensor. So they came up with this idea, hey, why don't we put this in people and have a sensor that can tell whether or not a drug is being delivered or whether or not a protein or something is, is getting, is present around uh, in the system of the, of the human body. So they invented this system. They wanted to first make sure that their tiny uh, golden nanoparticles didn't just drift off and wander around the body. So they uh, they created this porous hydrogel that they embedded in, and so the hydrogel itself has a tissue-like consistency. And then once it's implanted under the skin, like a little tattoo, small blood vessels and cells will grow into the pores of the hydrogel, and then they have incorporated, then at that point, the gold nanoparticles as well. So uh, quoting Professor Karsten Stone. 
Our sensor is like an invisible tattoo, not much bigger than a penny and thinner than one millimeter. Since the gold nanoparticles are infrared, they are not visible to the eye. However, a special kind of measurement device can detect their color non-invasively through the skin. So That's no fun. Down. <laughs> well, that's like what you want. You want to be able to get tested without having to go through uh, getting poked, I guess. Yeah, but don't yeah. you want a cool tattoo? <laughs> You, so can, what kind you of... could also get a, you could make a tattoo over it, I'm sure. You'd probably you, be fine. You could. You could incorporate a tattoo, the design into it. You could make it all fit in so it doesn't look like anything extra. But what would, what would you use this sensor for? Is it something, is this like insulin level sensing or is it, is this the kind of thing that will, it'll change over time? Like how, what are, what are they suggesting? Yeah, well, so the, well, one of the goals is to make it so that it can last a really long time. I think mm -hmm. this one, so far they got it up into the months of functioning. Okay. Uh, in their study, they, they took the, they implanted them in hairless rats. And they gave them various doses of an antibiotic. The molecules, when they passed by the sensor, were able to be uh, see the difference. The color change depending on the drug concentration. So if there is a concentration of anything in your blood that you could think you might want to know what that level is, yeah, this might be one way of, of being able to test it. Right? And, you, and this is also the sort of thing you could sort of end up seeing a home testing kit where you would put it over that little patch of your skin where you have it implanted, put the light sensor on it, and your, your phone might tell you, yeah, what your glucose level is or whether or not the, the drug that you've taken is in enough concentration or it passed through your body already. You're, yeah. you're trying to maintain the level. Uh, but yeah. Cool. The, the goal is to extend it to uh, to having a lifetime implant sensor so that you can do it once. Right. I'm just imagining people wanting to go back and get tattooed or implanted every few months. And that seems a little bit much. But if it's at least a few years, that could be good or lifetime best. And if but it yeah. can do more than just one thing. Sensing yeah, so, one thing that would so be cool. The, also. the gold, the gold uh, nanoparticles can be implanted with just about any kind of a sensor. I mean, right. they're perfect uh, uh, mounting mechanism for that. So, yeah, so I still think it would be better if it if it was if it was visible all the time. I still think. That... <laughs> hey, Blair, it's like look, it's just visible. Go get a Something's tattoo. wrong. Go no, get no, a gold I'm saying tattoo. that. I know that's so, what you for want. example, no, I'm, this is a serious comment. I I was oh. joking before, but this is serious. So if if you need to know your insulin levels. Right. It would be very nice to not have to pull out an indicator and think like, oh, I should oh, check my it insulin just levels. Changed color on your skin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That That'd is what I that's what I'm saying. I think I feel like that would actually be much more beneficial. Yeah. Yep. Very. All right, Blair, tell me mm. about your COVID stories. You've got yeah. a couple of COVID stories here. Bring it yeah. in. Yeah. So you might have heard some whisperings about COVID dogs, <laughs> nice portmanteau, uh, co dogs that can smell COVID. So there has not been any peer-reviewed study yet on the efficacy of dogs smelling COVID. And so something has begun at Rome's campus at Biomedico University Hospital. They uh, they started something a couple weeks ago um, on looking at the dog's ability to smell coronavirus in human sweat. And so um, they have, uh, you know, obviously we do antigen swabs now, which can take about 20 minutes. And those are the super rapid ones, right? Um, not to say the normal brain swabby thing, it takes, you know, days. But with a dog, they could tell in about 30 seconds if you have coronavirus, if this all works out, which would be super helpful for just imagine going through a drive through and having the dog sniff you and then, then be like, all right, you're good. You don't have COVID. <laughs> it would be so helpful. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'd it would, know it would that... be even more helpful at like a foot, uh, a football or soccer match or a rock concert or something in an airport, airport. exactly yeah. yes so just like drug sniffing dogs they'd be able to pick people out in these potentially super spreader situations right mm -hmm. um and so we already use dogs to detect human diseases like cancer diabetes parkinson's this has been proven a little bit through right. that 
Do we do we really use yes. them to diagnose? We do. do we yes. really? Yes. Wait, what? Usually, yeah. yes, they help diagnose what? and then tests back it up. Mm-hmm. But you can use yes, mm-hmm. yes, we are. Yes. It's not well used, what? but yes. No, yes. where? I'm so wait. No, we, we, I we still talked don't on the show it. a bunch about how other animals smell when conspecifics are sick, right? So this is something: is your body gives off certain scents when you're sick, and dogs have a really good sense of smell, so they can figure this out. So, um. There, there's been studies going on in lots of places. This one specifically was in Rome, but there's been uh, pilot programs happening in Finland, Germany, France, United Arab Emirates, all looking at dog sniffing trials. But so the first step is to get them to recognize volatile organic compounds from COVID from patients in a hospital. And then the second step that I love is they're actually doing a drive-through as a test subject um, where they take gauze of sweat. They then have the dog sniff it And they also take a nasal swab so they can test the efficacy against that. So this will be the first um, peer reviewed study of this when it's complete. Hopefully it works out and it should be really helpful in the coming months and years with coronaviruses. Yeah. Uh, Gold Zader in the chat on Twitch is saying, poor doggo is going to get COVID. No, no, no. (laughs) Hopefully not. (laughs) Cats are more uh, more likely to get infected. I'm, but, yeah. I'm still yeah. I'm still stuck on. Are they only doing the follow up test on the people that the dog said might have cancer? Because then I'm like worried about all the people that didn't get tested. Because no, I don't believe dogs can smell <laughs> cancer. So <laughs> first of all, they can, and second of all, no, there are lots of other no. ways if they think that you might have cancer that they can no, test. No, they can't. I'm just I'm sorry. No, they can't. Okay, so Justin's coming in with you can't. All right, so this let's move can't on. Be possible, because <laughs> you're just coming up against the science, just saying I, nope. nope um, that's so not real. Blair has more <laughs> stories though, so we can talk about the next COVID story. Uh, anyway, uh, so the other thing I know a lot of people, I know several people currently who had babies during lockdown, and um, there's some new studies coming out on breastfeeding moms. So the first peer reviewed study on whether you can pass on antibodies from COVID if you've been vaccinated while you're breastfeeding has come out. And yes, it does appear that that transfer happens as we anticipated. Um, Yeah. And of course I will say, here's the huge asterisks on this. It was five people, this study, but Mm. it was over 80 days. So this, again, this is very preliminary data, but over 80 days at the end of their study, they were still expressing antibodies in their breast milk at high levels. So it could be even past that. So this is also to say, we don't actually know how long our antibodies stay in our system from the vaccines yet either. So, <laughs> so this but is interesting days, to know. at least. <laughs> yeah. So that's, good. that's really good. That's um, good Yeah, so they had frozen breast milk samples after the two dose. This is the Pfizer specifically vaccine. And so this is the first peer reviewed evidence of antibodies being pushed down through the the breast milk. And um, prior studies on maternal vaccination with um, influenza and whooping cough have shown similar results for up to six months of antibodies getting uh, expressed through the breast milk. So looking really good. And uh, this is a, a really good time to reach out um, to anyone that you know who might have recently had a baby, if they they are eligible to get a vaccine because of that, so um, it would it might be really good for that because then you can inoculate your little baby at the same time. Yeah, there was something else also that uh, women who were inoculated while pregnant mm-hmm. passed on antibodies and protection to their babies, and so uh, that's also very good news. Yeah, especially since women who are pregnant are one of the groups who can be really poorly affected, badly yes. affected by uh, co- severe COVID. Yeah, so, absolutely. And you could yeah. see how if you have a newborn getting COVID could really mess you and the baby up as well. So uh, it would, yeah, really good. If Go get your COVID vaccine if you're pregnant or nursing uh, and you're protecting your baby too, which is so cool. Protect yourself, protect your baby. Yeah. I love it. All right. Do you want to talk about blobs for a couple of minutes, Justin? I can save it for later. You're going to save it for later? Yeah. All right. I have a puff piece, and I've also got some <laughs> uh, some some rain for later. Uh, I just want to tell you about this puff piece very quickly. 
researchers have, quote unquote, harnessed chaos <clears throat> dun, dun, to protect dun. your devices. Oh. Yeah. Oh. When I say puff piece, what I am talking about are physically unclonable functions. Physically unclonable functions. These are little unique differences in the chips that are created, and they're completely unique. And researchers have been trying to figure out how they can be used to increase security, make it harder for hackers to hack, to get into your devices. So these researchers from Ohio State University, Daniel Gauthier and his colleagues, they focus on chaos theory. And so they started applying chaos theory to these puffs, these physically unclonable functions in computer chips. And they, they've, they're trying to create a balance between the amount of chaos so that it's manageable chaos and creates what they call deterministic chaos, which is something that is potentially unhackable by hackers, but also manageable by the people creating it, as opposed to just pure chaos on your computer mm -hmm. chip. Um, so it's a new new method to hopefully making more secure chips. So it's hardware-based, not software-based necessarily in uh, future devices. Chaos! I, I, know, I, I think of computers as ordered and mm -hmm. not straying into entropy and chaos. And so to me, this is a very exciting. I feel like they're development. completely built on chaos. And there's just <laughs> like this, when you first get one, you have like this window of order you can get out of them. And then it's just... <laughs> and that is entropy from then on, yes. Yeah. But I think that's that's more descriptive of you. Than it, it's also you. that one, that very particular laptop that you had. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that. It's, it's actually the, uh, yeah, it's many of them. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is This Week in Science. If you just tuned in, we are talking about science. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you're enjoying the show, please tell a friend. All right, I would love to take this moment to introduce our guest tonight. Ben Goldfarb is, as he says, the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, winner of the 2019 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary, Literary Science Writing Award. His work has appeared in publications including The Atlantic, Science, Orion Magazine, and National Geographic, lives in Spokane, Washington, with his wife Elise and dog Kit, which is what you call a baby beaver. Welcome uh, to the show, Ben. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Beaver Day. Mm -hmm. Such such an appropriate day. I'm I'm really honored to be set to be celebrating with you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine a, a happier occasion. So I would. I'm curious how you came to be the guy who writes about beavers. How are you? What brought you into Beaver ecology, biology, and getting becoming passionate about these animals. Yeah, they just a, appeared to me in a in a dream one night and and said, "Write about me." Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I I you know I grew up uh, hiking and camping and fishing, so I was, I was always always around beavers. Had some kind of uh, a, a baseline appreciation um, for them as this sort of this neat animal who I heard you know smacking their tail uh, at night in in upstate New York when I went camping with my parents. Um, but it was really, you know, it was really in, in 2014 that I became a true uh, beaver believer, a beaver obsessive. Um, I was I was living in Seattle, you know, working as a journalist, looking for looking for stories, um, and I, I got a flyer for a, a beaver workshop. Um, and I, I didn't know what a beaver workshop entailed, but you know, that's that sounded like you know maybe maybe there's a, a story there. Um, so I, I went to this beaver workshop, and it was just this parade of of scientists, of ecologists, hydrologists salmon biologists, you know, fluvial geomorphologists, all of these ologists uh, yeah. talking about how critical this animal was uh, for all sorts of, of environmental reasons. Uh, and I realized that this, you know, this, this rodent that I had sort of taken for granted and, and known all my life well, was actually this profoundly important sort of shaper of landscapes and, and ecological restoration tool. So that was, it was, it was that workshop that got me super fired up about beavers and you know, I've been sort of exploring their world for the last uh, five or six years. I'm on the West Coast, grew up in California. I'm in Oregon now, and I did not grow up hearing beavers. Occasionally, we'd drive somewhere or go 
out and it's like, is that a beaver dam? But it's this rare thing. And everyone I would talk to is like, they're a pest. We don't like them. So wow. you're, you are talking about them as beneficial. And I want to hear what, why is there this disconnect? What's going on? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I think to understand the answer to that question, you have to sort of go back in, in time, hundreds of years. You know, historically, this was a, a ubiquitous animal, right? You would have seen beaver dams and ponds and wetlands all over North America. You know, before European arrival, there were maybe 400 million beavers or so is our, you know, our best population estimate uh, on, on this continent. And when we, when we wiped out beavers during the sort of the industrial fur trade, you know, they were killed uh, to turn their, actually I have a pelt here to, you know, to turn their, their, their pelts into, into hats. Uh, you know, when, when we wiped out hundreds of millions of beavers, you know, we eliminated all of those, those ponds and wetlands that, that beavers create. And I think that we, mm. you know, in many ways kind of forgot uh, what North America's landscape was supposed to look like or, or how it functioned and how blue and green and, and lush and wet it was. Uh, you know, when it had 400 million beavers uh, building building dams everywhere. So I think that's the, you know, it's sort of a case of, of ecological amnesia where we, we wiped out this really crucial species uh, and we've kind of lost our understanding of, of how important it is to the landscape. Uh, you know, because of course these, you know, these ponds and wetlands, you know, we know that especially in the American West, you know, water is life, uh, you know, and these, these habitats that beavers create, you know, they support amphibians, and, you know, and baby salmon and waterfowl and moose and, and swans and all kinds of uh, all kinds of critters. Um, so, you know, bringing this animal back uh, really requires us to sort of reconfigure our, our historical imagination and recognize just how deeply embedded this this critter is in, in uh, North American ecosystems. Some people have said that the, the beaver is as much of a. Uh, a as a landscape architect as humans. Do you agree with that? Um, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a shameless beaver apologist. So, you know, of course, I, th I, think that I, I love all the, all of the beaver superlatives. I mean, you know, I think I think that we we don't I think that the, the critical difference between beavers and humans is that, you know, we modify the landscape in very different ways. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to create landscapes that, uh, you know, destroy other species. Right. You know, we, we pave over everything. And, uh, you know, and put up, uh, you know, giant glass structures that, you know, kill migrating birds and so on. Whereas beavers, you know, beavers create these incredible wetland habitats um, that, you know, that support all kinds of all kinds of other species. So I think that, you know, I mean, beavers are, are probably second only to humans as, as landscape architects, but they're they're modifying ecosystems in ways that are profoundly beneficial to life, whereas we're doing it in ways that are profoundly detrimental to life. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at these images that you've taken through some of your work, these beautiful landscapes. We see the pile of sticks that juts up over the top of a pond or that is in the middle of a roaring stream kind of blocking the water creating a pond. Can you tell us what life is like for the beaver inside of that? Why are they why are they doing this? Why do the beavers make these things? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a good a good question. Um so you know so beavers are they're semi-aquatic animals, right? So they, they live in and around water. Uh they're really powerful, agile swimmers. They can stay underwater for, underwater for up to 15 minutes, so they're kind of champion breath holders. Um, that's a long time. It's a really long time, yeah. Um whereas you know when they venture out onto land, they're kind of these like fat, slow, waddling meat packages that get eaten by, you know, bears and cougars and wolves and coyotes. So, you know, by building those dams and creating those these nice deep ponds, you know, they're basically maximizing the extent of their own shelter, right? They're just engineering the habitat uh, in, in which they're safe. And I think it's, you know, it's just, I mean, it's incredible to me. Some of the, some of the structures they build, you know, I've seen dams that are, uh, you know, 15 feet high and, and 800 feet long. Uh, you know, I mean, just these these incredible monumental creations. Um, they're really, really amazing architects that don't really have any other analog in, in the animal kingdom besides besides humans. They, we killed them for their pelts. We took um, their we took their their land. We took their land. Um, yeah. And now and now what are they doing that makes people so upset about them? Why are why is it a struggle now to bring them back to main to, to basically let them come back into the ecosystems that they've been in. 
Right. So, so I think, you know, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that, is that good, good beaver habitat and good human habitat is the same habitat, right? We, you know, we both like these kind of broad fertile floodplains and, you know, low gradient streams. That's where, that's where they want to build their dams. And that's where we want to build our roads and rail lines and towns and farms and, and so on, right? So, you know, when we wiped out beavers, we then, as you said, we stole their land, right? We colonized these, you know, these, these floodplains that we had evicted them from. And then when they started to recover in the 20th century, uh, you know, they found that we had kind of occupied all of the good habitat, right? So when, when beavers come back and they start, you know, they start building these dams and creating these ponds, you know, they're doing it on top of infrastructure that we've that we've built in their in their absence, right? So, you know, there are all kinds of beaver conflicts. You know, they they flood people's fields and they, you know, they they build dams and road culverts and irrigation ditches and they cut down people's you know, ornamental trees or their, their fruit trees, you know, they're very, they're very meddlesome animals, right? They, you know, they love just, just like we are, they love to modify their surroundings. Uh, and, you know, and, and we're not really good at, at sort of tolerating other uh, intelligent sort of ingenious urban, urbanized creatures. You know, you, we kill ravens and coyotes and black bears and, you know, all of these animals that have the, the kind of the audacity to try to live live amongst us and and you know and beavers are kind of that that same way you know they're, they're this animal that you know precisely because they're such a a good landscape modifier you know we just have a hard time tolerating them blair did you have any questions about the about the beavers <laughs> well so yeah kind of um following up on this conversation we're having about how they've been gone and we're trying to bring them back so I grew up in the Bay Area and the San Francisco Bay, you know, I somebody once told me that beavers used to live in the San Francisco Bay and I thought they were crazy because they were just they were always these kind of like exotic animals to me that I had never seen. And of course, in my lifetime, just in the past few years, they've started coming back, which is amazing. But I guess my question is, why is it taken so long? Because I feel like we stopped hunting them a long time ago. So why this intense lag between mm. stopping hunting them in the United States and them now starting to reestablish in these areas? Yeah, that's such a good question, Blair. And, you know, I, I, mean, I think that I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that the, the Bay Area, because that because that actually has a, a very sort of unique, distinct beaver story uh, in, in some ways, uh, which I think really, really gets to your, your question. So you know, what's interesting about, about California is that California really had two separate fur trades it had it had an overland fur trade right you know all these these white trappers and traders kind of crossing the continent from east to west but then it also had a maritime fur trade right so it had it had you know guys on ships um from the spanish the russians the british uh you know americans coming around south america um and you know and and th that maritime fur trade really came first uh you know so so those guys wiped out beavers and sea otters and other, you know, sort of fur bearing animals. And then, you know, a few decades later, the overland trappers showed up in California and they said, well, you know, there's, there's no beavers here um, because they'd been trapped out, you know, 50 years earlier. And, and that conventional wisdom that, oh, there, you know, there are no beavers in the Bay Area basically became enshrined as scientific truth. Uh, so for a very long time, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife actually considered beavers a non-native species uh, in in the Bay Area and in much of California, and you know, and basically, um, you know, treated them with with extreme prejudice. Uh, and and so beavers, you know, have, have had a really hard time getting a foothold uh, in California, precisely because you know there's this kind of long legacy of considering them non-native. And and fortunately, you know, a few years ago, this this wonderful kind of interdisciplinary team of researchers, you know, assembled this wonderful trove of evidence, um, you know, archaeological evidence, um, anthropological evidence, you know, linguistic evidence, all kinds of different sort of lines of, of evidence, basically proving conclusively that, yeah, of course, beavers have been, they were all over California historically, uh, and there's no reason they, they wouldn't have been, you know, they live from, you know, Mexico to the Arctic Circle, there's no reason that the, you know, the Bay Area would have, would have repelled them. But, you know, I think, I think it's a really good example of how you know, we just don't really know what these landscapes look like. We don't really know where species were. You know, there's a lot of historical ecology that we're kind of lacking. And, uh, you know, and that just ends up having really detrimental legacies for the way that, that species are, are managed today. 
Okay, so then follow up question. <laughs> um, since you mentioned they're so widespread, yeah, are we worried about a reduction in genetic uh, stock in specific areas because they were practically completely eradicated in certain spaces, or because there's so many of them? in other areas, or at least their space is so wide. Do, do we feel like there's enough genetic flow for their population? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I mean, I mean, certainly they, I mean, they would have at the, at the end of the fur trade, you know, when, when we went from 400 million beavers to, you know, a hundred thousand beavers, maybe in North America, you know, they, they probably did pass through some kind of genetic bottleneck um, of some kind, but I've, I've never heard of, of any kind of, of you know, inbreeding concern in, in beavers. And I think that, you know, rodents in general, compared to a lot of other groups of organisms, organisms are actually, they're, they're pretty tolerant of, of, uh, of, of inbreeding and, and do pretty well. So yeah, I've never, I've never heard of, of any real genetic diversity concerns with beavers, uh, you know, in the way that you'd see in like California mountain lions, for example. Mm -hmm. So right. do you feel like beavers are going to end up being like, a cross between a duck and a squirrel in terms of how we see things in the wild. Do you feel like in the United States, we'll see them a lot more often in places where they haven't been in the next several decades? I don't know. That's, you know, if, if, I, if I get my way, that's, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I certainly hope so. You know, I mean, there's, there's some wonderful case studies of, you know, of, of communities and, and municipalities sort of learning to tolerate these animals in really urban settings. You know, what, like a few years ago I visited, uh, Logan, Utah, where this kind of this famous colony of beavers that lives in uh, this little tiny wetland, you know, the size of a, like a bathtub practically, uh, next to a, a Walmart parking lot, and you know, and and there, you know, like the, the, some scientists, the city managers, the Walmart guys, sort of all got together and they basically created this like beaver coexistence plan um, that you know allowed the beavers to remain next to next to the parking lot, um, and you know, and, and they've created this this wonderful little pocket of, of habitat and there are you know cutthroat trout and waterfowl and all kinds of things living in this incredibly urbanized space so you know i i think that we're i'd like to imagine that we're getting better at, at tolerating these animals and coexisting with them but you know we certainly still have a, a really long way to go and in oregon i was reading one of your articles that uh you, you mentioned that oregon has the beaver classified as a predator yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah what? <laughs> right maybe if you're an aspen tree or something that that makes right. sense but, you know but that i mean but that that designation basically allows any landowner to kill a beaver uh on, on his or her, her property mm -hmm. on on site and you know and that's the that's the kind of thing we need to get away from obviously and so it's so it's every state obviously is very different is it all uh in how they manage beavers um, yeah. are there any are there any states that you've seen you're like this is the model this is the way to do it i mean is it walmart park parking lots from here on out or is there a good model that's a good question so you know i'm, I'm i am biased as a as a washingtonian but i actually feel like like the state of washington has the, the best the best beaver laws in the in the country and a few years ago we, we passed this thing called the, the beaver bill which basically you know liberalized beaver relocation uh around washington so in california for example if there's you know if there's a beaver you know, flooding your backyard, uh, and you, you know, you, you call, uh, you know, a wildlife control person, that person basically has to kill the beaver. Uh, you know, there's really no option to live trap it and relocate it. Um, whereas in Washington, uh, you know, you are allowed to relocate beavers, and there are, you know, probably eight or 10 uh, different, you know, nonprofits and native tribes and agencies, uh, they're all sort of shuttling beavers around the state, you know, and using those, those, quote, unquote, nuisance animals, to kind of repopulate some of the watersheds that historically had beavers, but don't today. So I think that Washington has the best and friendliest kind of beaver relocation laws. Yeah, so I've never thought of a native species as being a nuisance animal. Right. And this is, this is kind of blowing my mind a little bit. I, yeah. Cause you usually think about nuisance animals as being invasive species. Right. But you know, that's, that's just our, our incredibly uh, kind of antagonistic mindset toward the, towards, <laughs> toward the natural world and, and beavers in particular. Okay. So you mentioned indigenous populations in Washington and how the, the beaver bill is working with those communities and uh, part of the, as part of the relocation plan. Um, has that, do you know much about how that has gone, how uh, working with indigenous populations is that has that been beneficial to the people to the beavers like is are there um other groups that are working in this way yeah good good question so 
Yeah, it's, and it's, it's been it's been wonderful. And, you know, there there are a few different um, native tribes in Washington that are are involved yeah. in beaver relocation. You know, the, the Tulalip tribe, which is just outside of Seattle, uh, the Yakima, the Cowlitz. I think those are the kind of the big the big three. Um, and what's you know what's so cool about that kind of example is that you know so in, in those cases you know really I mean those those tribes are interested in beavers primarily because they care about salmon, right? Salmon are yeah. you know these, these really important, um, of course, a very important food item. Uh, as well as this, you know, this deeply important cultural species, uh, and beavers create really good salmon habitat, right? You know, if you're if you're a you know a baby salmon, you know, you don't you don't want to live in kind of like the the fast flowing current. You know, you want to live in a, a deep pool uh, like like beavers create, right? So there's all kinds of peer reviewed literature showing that beavers are really good for salmon, and you know the tribe recognize that. And they say, you know, hey, we have so thanks to the the various treaties they signed in the 19th century, you know, they actually have a lot of salmon management authority. Uh, you know, the, the the tribes in Washington are, you know, when it comes to when it comes to salmon, are are, are uh, pretty politically powerful, um, which has basically given them the opportunity uh, to to relocate beavers and use beavers as this this salmon enhancement tool. Uh, essentially, so I think that's you know I think that's that's really exciting is seeing seeing native native people kind of take take the lead on, on beaver restoration in, in Washington, and now that's you know that's happening in other states today as well. I hope that that is happening in Oregon also because that uh, salmon is a huge part of native po- native populations here, and I yeah think that would be beneficial. We need to stop calling them predators first. Oh my gosh. That's insanity. Yeah. <laughs> I am <laughs> concerned. <laughs> right. But, you know, but, I, but, I, but I think, you know, I think to that point, I mean, this, you know, this notion that beavers are this, you know, this really beneficial animal. I mean, of course, that's not, you know, that's, that's not an idea that's original to Western science. You know, I mean, that's something that, that native people have recognized for thousands mm-hmm. of years. Um, you know, Rosalind Lapierre, who's a, a Blackfeet uh, historian and, and a botanist, uh, you know, has written about how, you know, the Blackfeet tribe in Montana uh, revered beaver and sanctified them and actually had cultural prohibitions against killing them uh, because they recognized that, uh, you know, hey, in this arid, you know, Western environment, you know, these are animals that create these kind of ecological oases that are, are super important. Um, you know, so which is which is why, you know, in the 19th century, when the white people showed up, uh, you know, the kind of the fur trappers like you see in the movie The Revenant, you know, like Jim Bridger and Kit Carson and Hugh Glass, you know, all of these mountain men. I mean, the reason they had to go kill beavers themselves was because, you know, the Western tribes refused to trade with them. They wouldn't kill beavers and sell the pelts because they understood how important these animals are. So this notion that beavers are this beneficial animal that's, you know, deeply embedded in landscapes. I mean, that, you know, that goes back thousands of years. And we just said, oh, forget that. We like the pelts. You need to move. We're going to put our roads in. Time for you to go. (laughs) I feel like there's so much movement in conservation and in a lot of uh, scientific fields that deal with the earth ecology people and those and where they overlap. um, That's really realizing where we've gone wrong and that we yeah. need to start talking with the people who have lived in the lands for thousands of years <laughs> and that there's a lot of knowledge there that we that we overlooked that we 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 the hubris that we had um has led us to a place that's not sustainable as a result yeah you know i, th- I think that that hubris is the is the perfect word for it right you know i think that's i mean that's one of the really exciting things about about sort of the beaver movement is that you know, implicit in the beaver movement is this idea that, you know, hey, there is this animal that manages the landscape a lot better than we people do, right? That, that like, we're, we, we actually screw things up, uh, whereas beavers kind of set things right again. Uh, and that, you know, the way to heal our ecosystems is by sort of outsourcing restoration to a rodent, you know, and that's, and that's this kind of very uh, heterodox idea that, that runs against our kind of like fanatical micromanagement of, of nature, right? Which is why, you know, which is I think why people take a lot of a lot of convincing to embrace beavers because it it you know requires kind of letting go of that that hubris as as you put it, and you know, and, and being and being humble, remembering that hey, you know, there are other species on this planet that, you know, that that influence the landscape in more beneficial ways than we do. Absolutely. So this kind of brings it around a bit to, you mentioned salmon and, uh, you know, human impacts, the roads that we're building. That is a new 
area of interest for you, road ecology? Um, was it looking at beavers and, and how they were affected by human roads that led you down the path of starting to look at how roads impact ecology? You know, it's, it's funny, actually, that my, my interest in, in roads kind of predates the beaver, the beaver stuff. Um, you know, I, I was, I guess, in maybe in 2013 or 12 or something like that. You know, I was I was in I was in Montana, you know, and, and did I did a, an article um, about about road ecology. And I, I went up um, with uh, a researcher um, up onto one of those, you know, those wildlife overpasses, you know, those, the bridges that I'm sure you've all seen pictures of. And that, that was just so inspiring. You know, the, the notion of of this infrastructure that we would build um, explicitly to, you know, to make our world more navigable and permeable for wild animals. That seemed like a really inspiring vision to me. Um, but, you know, I think that the, like the the road, you know, the road book that I'm writing now uh, really emerges from the same sort of general set of interests as the as the Beaver book, which is just, you know, I'm just fascinated in, by environmental history, um, by you know why our landscapes look the way they do, what sort of historical forces have changed them over time, and you know what we can do to kind of set set them right again. So you know, I think I think about um, yeah, the Beaver book and the road book is sort of being uh, part and parcel of the same interest in sort of infrastructure and the built and natural world and where they collide. There's one, as there, there are multiple aspects of roads. There's the physical road going through habitats and cars and how that impacts right. animals in their ecosystems. But then there's also the, the stuff that we don't see. There's the chemical runoff. There's, uh, we've talked mm. a bunch on this show, Blair's brought stories about the chemicals from tires, whether it's the rubber from the tires. Um, and there's a study that recently came out that pin. No, it's yeah. not a mic. It's a microplastic, but there's a study that uh, just came out with, with pinpointing a specific chemical that interacts. It's like a, a preservative for rubber that interacts with ozone before the ozone interacts with the rubber. And it's the offspring of that chemical interaction that floods into the waterways and then kills salmon. I'm sure it probably yeah. impacts beaver. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, what can I, what can we what are we missing with roads? How much how much are we impacting the world with our roads and our cars? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, certainly the chemical impacts are, are a, a big deal. You know, I mean, road salt and the amount of road salt we put down. Uh, you know, both I mean, both the sodium and the chloride have their own sort of set of, of uh, you know, very discreet and, and kind of catastrophic impacts in a, a lot of respects. Um, you know, the one that I think about a lot is, is road noise, uh, which I, you know, I think is kind of this hidden uh, public health crisis that, you know, we, we really take for granted. Um, you know, I didn't think about it much until I started writing this book. And then I realized that, you know, I live about, about a half mile from I-90 and, you know, wherever I sit on my porch, I can just kind of hear like the hiss of traffic, uh, you know, probably... Right, exactly. You know, raising raising my my cortisol levels and and uh, you know probably shortening my lifespan. I mean, something some some of the you know some of the some of the data out there about like how many cumulative years of human life are being sacrificed to to road noise pollution. It's just it's just completely uh, appalling. You know, and the, and the same impacts are also really affecting uh, wild animals. Right. You know, we I mean, there's all kinds of literature about about road noise and how it makes the songs of, of birds, uh, you know, less effective, um, you know, it, it stresses birds out, uh, you know, they, they forage more poorly and, and, and so on. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, road noise is really, it's this form of habitat loss in a sense, you know, there's this envelope, uh, this noisy envelope around the road uh, that animals just don't want to hang out in because, you know, because they, they generally uh, don't, don't love that noise. So it's, you know, so, so roads are, you know, that acoustic pollution is affecting the lives of both humans and, and other species in all kinds of really complex ways that we're just starting to understand. And, you know, that's a that's a whole chapter of the book, too, for sure. That's fantastic. I mean, though, speaking of the noise, I wonder how it is that so many deer have car impacts every year, because shouldn't they hear the cars coming? Yeah. With all that noise, you would think. Maybe they get just kind of numb to it. I mean, the, my last apartment was next to a major freeway, and um, I had no idea how loud it was till I moved. And then, yeah, it was kind of what you're talking about. Like, my shoulders were lower all the time, so right. stressed out. I could have the windows open. It wasn't loud, but also just like, yeah, you wouldn't notice, but then you'd shut the window and go, 
my God, I've been shouting this whole time. I feel like that's the deer, right? They just get super used to it, probably. Yeah, there's there's definitely acclimation that happens. You know, and also look, I mean, I mean, whether you know, like it or not, animals have to move, right? Um, you know, if we I mean, of course, mule deer, you know, in the West, you know, they're moving from summer range to winter range twice a year. You know, amphibians are moving from forests to breeding ponds. Uh, you know, all of these large carnivores like cougars and you know, wolves and bears are, you know, moving around these kind of giant ranges they patrol. You know, movement is sort of this inherent fundamental aspect of, of animal life you know so it, it, in a, a densely roaded world inevitably you know mobile animals have to have to cross roads uh and that's that's just an incredibly dangerous interaction for them obviously yeah have you have you learned much more about uh the chemical the chemical runoff and other uh other problems with the the chemicals that are getting into the ecosystems you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, certainly, I, I don't know much more about the the uh, the, the the tire study than what you just uh, la- laid out. But I mean, you know, think you think about, I mean, how much sort of impervious surface we've created with roads, right? I mean, you know, of course, in a, a sort of a, a a healthy landscape is a is a permeable, porous one where you know the rain falls and it infiltrates the ground. Whereas you know we've created this um, this kind of this hard shell, uh, and you know, and every time it rains, you know, all of that all of that stormwater ends up sweeping. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly road salt, uh, those tire particles you mentioned, you know, copper from brake pads, motor oil, gasoline, uh, you know, sort of like particulate matter from tailpipes. I mean, it's just like this huge array of of car related pollutants uh, that just get, you know, swept into the nearest the nearest body of, of, of water. I mean, that's you know, absolutely one of the biggest contributors to I mean, certainly salmon loss uh, in, in Puget Sound. Um, so, you know, and that's, I mean, just to, just to sort of return to, to beavers, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. one of the, the wonderful things that beavers do is they create these, these kind of settling ponds, right. Um, you know, where, where all of those, all of those, those contaminants have an opportunity to kind of drop out of the water column and, you know, be entrained, uh, in the kind of the, the sediments at the bottom of the pond. Uh, you know, there's lots and lots of, of literature out there about sort of beaver's role in in enhancing water quality especially in, in, in urban areas that's another you know another kind of big rationale for beaver restoration is is you know is the, the kind of the chemical impacts that they're helping to mitigate so all of our uh, pharmaceuticals could settle out into the bottoms of their ponds <laughs> yeah, they're going to do some, some some really some really hyped up you know Adderall, <laughs> invertebrates that are yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, they're, I mean, and they're they're really they're really tough tough animals. I, I saw somebody um, from the the federal government in Colorado sent me a picture uh, a few months ago of of, uh, of beavers who had built a dam in the, in an old flooded mine shaft in in Colorado. Uh, and the and the the water was just it was just like it was just orange with you know all kinds of copper and other heavy metals and crap. It was just you know it was the, the nastiest looking water. Um, and the beavers, you know, the beavers were 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 living, uh, you know, as far as anybody could tell, pretty pretty happily uh, in the the kind of the uh, the shaft of this mine. So they're you know they they seem like tough critters uh, who can who can really handle uh, just these, these just a little water. liver toxic toxicity. That's all. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Don't eat I, that beaver. Pelt. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. I feel. I feel bad for whatever cougar that's you know bioaccumulating into. <laughs> yeah. So between, I mean, beavers. Maybe they can save us from roads. Probably not. But um, what do you have any thoughts like that you want people to like take with them about uh, roads and how we approach driving and how we get places and from what you're learning with uh, your research for your book? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I think that one of the, one of the, the, the big takeaways for me diving into the literature is, is just how, how, how ineffective it actually is to ask drivers to do anything. Um, you know, that like that, that people, I mean, like, you know, like I, I drive everywhere. Uh, and this is such a, this is such a defeatist attitude in some ways. Um, right. But, you know, but like, but there are all, all these studies basically showing, for example, that you know, reducing the speed limit doesn't do anything because people just don't obey the speed limit. Um, and, you know, and, and putting up those, you know, the, those, those <clears throat> leaping deer signs, you know, does nothing because people just ignore signage and they get habituated to signage. Um, so trying to, you know, tr- I think that trying to influence driver behavior, um, especially in such a, an intensely car oriented culture as, as ours is just, 
that's just such a that's a that's a tough nut to crack uh, in a lot of respects, you know. And I, so I, I think that it makes more sense in some ways to try to influence animal behavior, uh, you know. And how do you do that? Well, you do you do that using you know, basically fences and wildlife crossings, right? Overpasses and underpasses that, you know, that, that animals can use to cross the road. And the fences... So you're, course, you're talking about basically separate sanctuary land for them to, to be able to roam on and be nature and have it be a, a separate segment, a segment space away from uh, us. The people humans. trails. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Or, or not, a, you know, not, a, not a separate space, but just, you know, having sort of, separating where they're crossing the road from the surface of the road itself, right? So they're moving. You're under- giving them their own lane, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right, Blair. You know, and then, but, and of course, you know, for the, for the animals to be able to find those, those, those lanes, you know, you need, you need fences along the roadside, right? They can't just, they can't just look and cross wherever they want because they'll, then they'll get hit. You need fences to kind of funnel them to those, those kind of designated lanes. So that's, you know, I think that's a, for me, that's a big takeaway um, from the, you know, from, from reading the literature is that, you know, those people always ask like, you know, do the, do, do animals really use those, you know, those bridges and underpasses? And, you know, and, and the answer is yes, they, they absolutely do. Um, you know, when those structures are, are well designed, right. And, you know, the, like, you know the, there's a lot you can do to sort of make them more appealing to animals. Um, it's, it's we, a have whole, a, whole we have a, uh, we have a tunnel that we built next near a waterway and the sort of busy intersection of downtown Davis. Uh, that was for the toads that would be come from one side and they try to get across the road and they'd get squished. And it uh, quickly, it was it dubbed the toad tunnel when it was built, but it was only ever been used by rats. As far <laughs> as anybody can tell, the rats love it. It really cuts down on their commute, <laughs> but nobody's seen a toad go through. Oh, right. So, so that's actually, so just, that's, actually, that's actually a really infamous project in the kind of history of road ecology because, you know, because that, that tunnel was built without any kind of, you know, there was no science behind it. it you know, it was, it was, it, it was way too sort of tight and narrow. It was way, it was much yeah, too. Yeah, I don't think you could hop through it. I don't think it, no, it was right. like too it was, low clearance. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> just right. make a tube. They'll be fine. Right. But, you know, I mean, those sorts of, of kind of failures, I mean, really cast aspersions upon the entire concept of, you know, of, of road ecology and, and animal friendly infrastructure. Right. So, we, you know, so we know that, yeah, that, like there are all kinds of, you know, crappy pipes out there that, you know, that animals aren't using. Um, but we also know that, you know, if you if you, de- if you design these things right, um, they really do get get used and, and help uh, help populations for sure. So there's a lot more than just the little cattle cattle guards. To keep and Montana's done a few things. Road, I mean, right. Did Montana have to do a reintroduction program with beavers of some sort? Or did they just stop hunting them? Because I feel like at some point they reintroduced and it changed the landscape. It was about the same time I think that they were re- reintroducing the wolf, stopped hunting them. But I sort of recall there was like this whole this sort of study, like here was this area of deforested, you know, open field land. They reintroduced and suddenly... Because the beavers were there to make the dams, the waters were there enough to feed the, all the lush vegetation again, and then with the wolves, the, the deer were afraid to, to stay in the forest, so they moved out into the open field so they could see everything, so they stopped, started dropping seeds all over the open fields, and there's more shrubberies and more trees were growing everywhere, and it sort of just the whole thing, with, by adding beaver and wolf to, back to where they'd been before, totally re- revitalized uh, nature by just adding those really key components to the, the biome there. I, yeah. I find it, I find it scary though, to be a, to be a, a, a beaver enthusiast. What is it? A beaver advocate? A beaver believer. A beaver believer. Beaver I mean, believer thank it's you. a little too co- <laughs> little too <laughs> close to the be- believers. The, it's a little too, because, little too close. Because I mean, it's gotta be a little bit scary though and intimidating because more, I think more than half of the American waterways, fresh waterways are, are heavily managed. I mean, it's hard to think of any place where there's, you know, certainly California, we're looking at every piece of water like it's a commodity, you know, down to to creek level. It's really hard to find uh, nature space that you could be like, ah, yeah, let them go, go to town, let them do what they need to do, where it wouldn't, you know, destroy a town's water supply or, yeah, cause massive flooding and all this sort of thing because we're so overbuilt and overmanaged in our specific way. We've managed it not as if as if nothing else lives. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but, you know, I, I, I think that's a, that's definitely a big a big part of why California is so hostile to beavers. You know, it's the, I mean, California's what like you know the most hydrologically modified landmass on Earth, or, or something like that. Um, and you know, and, and yeah. yeah, you know, and and you know, beavers love damming in in irrigation canals and ditches, right? That's like kind of it's kind of the perfect stream for a beaver to dam. And of course, people don't like beavers, you know, messing with their 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 waterworks for sure. But that, you know, when we said before about the kind of the beaver wolf connection, I mean, you know, you guys could do like an entire episode on, on trophic cascades. And I think I think you should. I, I would I would love to listen to that. Um, <laughs> I've but, definitely done uh, at least 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, <cool. laughs> um, but, you know, but certainly that, yeah, that, that beaver wolf interaction is is uh, is really, really interesting. You know, you, you know, because it, it's it is true that, you know, I mean, beavers need. You know, they need food, right? They need that streamside, you know, willow, aspen, cottonwood, that food and, and building source. And, you know, there's no question that, you know, over overpopulated ungulates, elk and deer and, and you know, and moose can can deprive them of that. You know, so you have to, you know, you have to manage that that intense large mammal browsing somehow if you're going to have beavers. Uh, and, you know, and, and wolves are kind of one way of potentially managing that that uh that vegetation consumption for sure the the way that all the animals interact is so fascinating i mean you we hear about the food web and we hear about these ecological predator prey interactions and so you think about the wolves and the the wolves and the deer you don't think yeah. about then that the the secondary effects of how the deer are potentially affecting the beaver and how the beaver is affecting the salmon and that's also going to affect bear populations and that's going you know the way it all interconnects is. Yeah, I, you know, I, th- I, think, I think a lot of I think about that a lot. You know, in in um, in Washington these days, you know, of course the uh, you know the the orcas, right? The southern resident killer whales in Puget Sound have been, you know, those are, those are such a, a species of concern now. Um, you know, and there's just this. I mean, there's kind of this fascinating you know, like statewide cascade where, you know, you like, you know, we're, we're getting wolves back in Eastern Washington and really all over the state now, um, you know, you, you need the wolf to have the beavers and you need the beavers to have the salmon, you need the salmon to have the orchids, you know, it's, and you sort of go from, you know, from it's kind of like terrestrial apex predator to marine apex predator. And there's this kind of this nutrient flow, uh, you know, uniting land and, and water and these, these two apex predators. I think that's a, a really cool sort of cascade to think about. That is. Fantastic. And you need the beavers in there. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I so might as well just say my uh, catchphrase at this point. Protect habitats, not species. Yes. yes. Yeah. Or you could or you could protect the species that creates the habitat. Yeah. Like. <laughs> there you go. That's the beaver well, see, if we had protected habitat yeah. for the beavers to hang out in, then no one would be mad at them. It'd be fine. That's, that's true. Are, there, are there other species that are habitat creators in quite the same way i mean yes humans we're the habitat creator destroyer maker so it, destroyer of worlds but what I'll, other species i'll say are... what like our people listening are probably yelling at the screen right now so elephants are architects for sure nice. um they create landscape um alligators in in the southeast create alligators habitat. yes so when they're what? sloshing around in the bayou they yeah. are creating little pools that baby fish can grow up in. So uh. it's not quite on the level of beavers, but yes, there are other species that and, are architects in their own right. And, you know, course, there's course, also, of mammoth, course... Mammoth, mammoth, of course, you're right. <laughs> mammoth. Bring, always brings back to the mammoth. There's, always bring there's... back the mammoth and bring back the, the Canadian tundra to what it used to be. <laughs> there's also <laughs> what I like to consider, like, super poopers in the... Um, in the rainforest so there's animals mm. that eat so much diverse plant life and move around enough that they are basically propagating the entire rainforest all the time so that's right. kind that's of a, a like kind of figures. architecture also yeah <laughs> i'm really you know maybe maybe i'm just a, i'm just like a, a rodent guy but but you know i think a lot about prairie dogs you know these animals that create these elaborate burrow systems that are are habitat for other species and also are really important in sort of allowing rainfall to kind of infiltrate into the soil and, and re- recharge aquifers. Um, I think it's a really good prairie dog book to be written, maybe maybe by somebody else. Uh, who has already, uh, <laughs> You're not going to go there? <laughs> you wrote in book, yeah. <laughs> well, then you have to get into ferrets, and that's like a whole thing. Yeah. There's a lot ferrets. there. Fascinating story, for yeah. sure. <laughs> the clonal ferrets. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, all of all of this is just, it, 
when you think about it. It's so fascinating. Okay, wait, rodents, R-O-U-S's. What's your, uh, your, what is the, uh, the southern rodent that is massive pest rodent that they're the starting capybara. to- The capybara. The is is it capybara. Oh, that's, no, it's yes. not capybara. That's South American. She, oh, you're talking about, about the like nutria. You're talking about the nutria. Yeah. I'm talking about the nutria. Yeah. Yes. What is your, do you have a take on the nutria? <laughs> um, I, 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 do, I don't have a, a hot nutria take. <laughs> um, I, I, hear, I hear they're I hear they're pretty tasty. Um, you know what? What one of the things that you know nutria most often come into my beaver world because you know because beavers actually create pretty good nutria habitat. Unfortunately, right? Nutria, you know, yeah. aquatic mammal, um, so they do well in, in beaver ponds. So in, in in Oregon, actually, you know, there are lots of uh, sort of beaver ponds that also have nutria in them. And people always say, well, you know, wait a second, aren't the beavers encouraging the nutria? And you know, I feel like. You know, again, I'm a beaver apologist. I, I feel like, you know, the habitat creation for native species, you know, far outweighs any invasive uh, concerns you, you might you might have. Um, yeah. My, my other my other big nutria gripe is that people are always posting pictures of nutria and saying, oh, look at this beaver I saw. Um, and no. uh, <laughs> I, gave, I gave a talk recently, which was, which was promoted with a picture of a nutria. I was very, very unhappy about that. Um, what is so, it, most, yeah. most dragonfly tattoos are damselflies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like now yeah. I have to go Get back your to the species wrong. gift that I shared because I didn't even think about that. But no, I, I'm pretty sure I shared a beaver. <laughs> 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 it had yeah, a nice too. flat tail. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> What is one, yes. what is one just completely awesome random fact about beavers that you just, you just have to share? What have we, what have you not shared yet? That's just like, this is ridiculous and awesome. Well, do you, do you guys know about, about uh, castorium? No. Nope. So, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so beavers, <laughs> the beavers are there. Justin, Justin knows the story, but 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 beavers are they have so they have um, castor sacs, which is basically this scent gland which they use to kind of mark their territories and you know communicate with other beavers. They're you know they they they're sort of like they're amazed amazing smellers. They you know then they send these very elaborate sort of chemical messages to each other. Um, but that you know that that castorium, this the substance that's produced by their their castor sacs, uh, has been you know has been used by people for thousands of years for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, in in Europe and Asia, it was sort of used as this like panacea to treat anything from you know epilepsy to constipation, um, and it actually had you know it was incredibly incredibly valuable. Um, and you know, and, and more recently, uh, you know, in the in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries, you know, it was, it was used um, as a kind of a, a flavor additive for things like you know fruit soda and and vanilla ice cream, uh, and it's still it's still used in in perfume today. Um, so I just want vanilla in my vanilla ice cream. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would think so. Yeah. So you know, so this, so this, this beaver, you know, this beaver secretion um, has just been incredibly valuable for all kinds of reasons over the years. In fact, you know, in North America, you know, the beavers were wiped out for their their pelts. Um, but in in Europe, you know, it was really that it was that castorium trade uh, that primarily drove their their near extinction. So this is this hmm. kind of crazy substance that they that they uh, secrete that uh, humans have always. I've always is there, surprised. Yeah, is there any science behind it, or is this snake oil? Is this just like people are like, it does this? It's you know, it's the yeah. tastes like vanilla. Special medicine. <laughs> I'll sell you right. a bottle. You know, that, or is it's there a, something to that's it? That's a great question. So, so, so the castorium, so the, so the compounds in the castorium are you know are, are things that beavers derive from the trees they eat, right? The bark they eat, um, mm-hmm. and one of the compounds uh, comes from willow. Uh, and is salicylic acid, uh, which is the active aspirin. ingredient in aspirin, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, do, so um, is there much science behind you know beaver castorium as medicine? No, uh, but you know, is there some kind of pain relief potential there? Yeah, maybe. But we we have salicylic acid, so why do we need a be need the beavers? Salicylic well, right. Acid? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we can leave the beaver out of that. We can, yeah. Let's leave the beavers alone. Yeah, let them let it be there. Let them do their things. Absolutely. Okay. Is there something that people can do to help beavers? Is there like, are there organizations or are there places they can go? Or is this a, you know, find out about how they're 
classified in your home state because I had no idea there were a predator in Oregon, you know, um, and then write a letter to your senator or, you know, what what can people do? Yeah. Well, you know, I think... um... All kind of, I mean, a lot of different things. So, I mean, first, if you know, if you're, if you are, if you happen to be a person who has, you know, a beaver on your, on your property, you know, um, you could certainly, uh, you know, attempt some, some non-lethal coexistence strategies. Check out the, the Beaver Institute. Uh, beaverinstitute.org has, you know, all kinds of great resources on sort of like how you can coexist with beavers. Um, you know, I think that, that more, more likely, more practically, uh, and maybe, it's, you know, just, just because I'm a, I'm a, a road guy. Um, but, you know, but I, I, I think that, you know, the most, so the, the kind of the most common beaver conflict uh, in North America is beavers building dams in road culverts where the streams go under the roads, right? Because yeah. you know, if you're a beaver, right, like the road bed is this fantastic dam and the culvert is the leak in the dam, right? And beavers plug up the just leak. And then they just <laughs> just it. It. It's, 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 right. <laughs> Don't you humans want me to do this for you? Um, you know, and then the, the water rises and the road washes out and it's really, you know, expensive to, to, to repair. So, you know, so, so I think that most of the, maybe not most, but a lot of the beavers that are killed are beavers that are, are damming and road culverts. Um, and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and those are, I mean, those are public roads, right? So they're, you know, they're managed by, you know, a, a, a town council or a county commission or a state transportation agency or, or whoever. Um, so, you know, and, and there are lots of great examples of, of communities around the country that have basically said, you know, hey, we no longer want to manage our culverts by killing every beaver that approaches them. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to use these, you know, kinds of like non-lethal contraptions, uh, these kind of pipe and fence systems that basically, you know, keep the water flowing freely through the culvert, even if the beaver tries to dam it. Um, and, you know, you can say a lot beaver of proof culverts. Beaver what? Culverts. So it's really, really frustrated cool. beavers. Right. I know. So, this is just so, not working. <laughs> so the, the Beaver Institute has all kinds of, you know, they've got all kinds of research resources about how to sort of beaver proof your culverts. So I would, I would talk to like, I would figure out like, you know, who is managing the culverts on your, you know, your local roads and, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and talk to that, that body, because that's going to be some kind of, you know, public commission or council or agency that you could potentially influence. Yeah. And we can't, yeah, people, you can influence things. So yeah, don't just yeah. drive on by. Don't just right. be a person on the road, ignoring <laughs> everything. No, and that's, you know, that's one of the cool things about beavers too, is that like, you know, talking to the pe- people in the, in the beaver verse over the last few years, and you know, so many of them, uh, you know, yes, there are, you know, trained biologists uh, who are, you know, beaver experts and, and passionate beaver believers, but they're also like, you know, there are former child psychologists and, and, you know, and physicians assistants and realtors and hairdressers, you know, lots of, lots of people who just got uh, incredibly enamored of this animal and, uh, you know, devoted their lives to it and became really some of the, some of the, the foremost experts in its, in its, its, uh, its conservation. So, you know, there's, there's uh, beavers just have this way of like roping in normal people and turning them into uh, you know, I feel like all these I feel like all these people were secretly subversive to begin with. <laughs> that's, I think that's right. And beavers, are, beavers are just the the, the outlet for their yeah. The, this the is their representative. Yeah. They're gonna okay. They're, they're gonna, gonna knock down some stuff. They're gonna build some dams. They're gonna try to turn this this complex futuristic uh, hellhole we created into back into nature. I'm all for it. Right. They're like they're like, they're like eco terrorists. Yeah. Yeah, oh, nice ones game. that are yeah. saving beavers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, so where can people find out more about you and find your books? And when is your road ecology book going to be coming out? Yeah, sometime in like 2046. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, no. Okay. Oh. Well, just a couple weeks. Man. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so. It's just like another it's March. So. That's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I hope, hopefully next year. I would, I would love that. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, as, as for me, um, yeah, bengoldfarb.com is my, my website and then, uh, Twitter. Um, you know, I love, I love, I love, seeing pictures of people's, you know, I get, I get like so many pictures of uh, beaver dams and lodges and beavers that people tweet at me. I, I, I love being part of beaver Twitter. So if you've got be some beaver tweets to share, um, you know, yeah. Ben, Ben Goldfarb on Twitter. Hit me up there. I love that. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful talking with you this evening. Yeah. yeah it was such a fabulous uh, celebration for the, the holiest day on, on our calendar. <laughs> <laughs> the most the 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 beaverist day on the calendar. 
for Definitely sure. It's going to be very day. Yeah. Right. Thank, Thank you, you for joining so us to talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone, Ben Goldfarb, he is the author of The Secret, The Surprising and Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. The whole book yeah, of you, beavers. If you didn't, if you didn't uh, believe before, he'll make you a beef believer. He'll be just... A beaver. It's too so hard. He's had practice. He's had practice. He has had practice. I just I'm added just beaver to, to my list of animals for the 2022 calendar. Just oh, perfect. Just See, it's already yes. making a difference. It's already changing the future. We've all got the beaver fever now. <laughs> I mean, I just... I just want to. I just one. really want to see them in <laughs> the San Francisco the Bay. Just, I feel like yeah. if I saw one, I'd be like, "It's like seeing a flamingo." It's like, what? Do you see that? I right. I've yeah. never. Yeah. I don't. They're not supposed think to I've, be there. I don't think I've ever seen a beaver. I could be wrong. I might have seen one in Canada, but I, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen a beaver. But I do recall seeing uh, beaver dams. Up in the foothills, uh, when I was a wee little young. A wee young. tyke? A wee we tyke, uh, maybe? We'd be walking along, and every once in a while, you'd see one of these uh, these creeks that had, like, you know, uh, that they had created a pond. It was a good place to go swimming, as long as the beaver would get upset. But I don't think but the, the beaver would be fine with you I swimming in its pond. I never that's saw fine. a beaver, though. Just yeah, it's not like an otter that's going to mess you up. They're just, <laughs> I think they're Ooh. pretty chill. <laughs> they are chill just like we are because hey this is this week in science thank you for joining us tonight i want to ask you if you could please if you have the ability head to twist.org and click on the patreon link your support really helps us continue to keep this show going week in and week out and honestly I love reading off our list of names at the end of the show. Anybody $10 and above per month, I'm going to read your name at the end of the show, unless you don't want me to, and then I, and then I won't do it. But I, I love trying to micro-machines it and <laughs> get all the names in and really get a sense of this community that keeps this show going. You can keep it going. Keep the sanity and the science coming into the world. Help us reach audiences. Help us reach new listeners. You're a part of all this. Thank you for your support. We really can't do this without you. And now we're going to come on back. And we're going to get into some more animals because it is time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature. Cry that What you got, Blair? Just trying to make my camera focus. That was crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> was out there. I bit. have uh, some surprising hidden talents. Hidden uh, some s- hidden talents. Hidden. You have some <laughs> invertebrates. <laughs> uh, yikes. Um, okay, so <laughs> my first story is about cone snails. Cone snails are famous for being uh, one of the most painful animals in the world. Um, They have a harpoon-like tooth at the end of a proboscis that injects venom into their prey. And for prey, it will paralyze them. For humans, it'll put you in excruciating pain and maybe kill you. But... Yikes. Yes, but cone snails are also responsible for a huge suite of medicines because that venom is the key to a lot of pain relievers. And so most scientists have focused their research on cone snails that hunt fish. And um, the venoms from these gastropods are uh, called peptides, the protein segments inside the venoms. And these peptides are used to develop drugs. But because of their structural composition, they can only be injected. They can't be taken orally. So it's kind of an intense use for uh, pain relief. If it has to be injected, right? So it, you can it's either not... Be, you can either be stabbed by the cone snail or in, with the needle 
with the needle, with the needle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's it's something that you would do like if you went to see a doctor or you were in the hospital. It's not something that you would be injecting yourself with at home. So it's it's not an over the counter pain, right? So that's kind of the pro con of this is that cone snails have given us a lot of insight into pain relief, but the nature of the venom brings us to this kind of intense version of drug. Enter worm hunting cone snails and their nature as a femme fatale. <laughs> this is from wait, the University wait, of Utah femme Health fatale. Scientists. Yes, 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 yes. What they do is they seduce the worms and then eat them. <laughs> so they... Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. Um, okay. They use a previously undetected uh, small set of molecules that mimic worm pheromones to encourage worms out and into a sexual frenzy, but makes it easier them for them to gobble them up. So yes, they're they're femme fatale. They turn the natural sex drive of their prey into a lethal weapon. And they do hope that because these molecules are completely different, that they could uh, bring in new avenues of medicine. So let's let's look at this a little bit. So um, this cone snail that hunts worms, known as fireworms, they produce small chemicals that mimic the pheromones of the fireworms. The small molecules in this snail has a chemical called uh, conazolium A, which sparks the behavior, beha uh, the mating behavior in female worms. So they swim in tight tail chasing circles and then they release their eggs. At the same time, they have another chemical, genuanine which is kind of like uric acid and has the effect on males prompting them to move around a bunch and then eject their sperm. So they have two different chemicals that they are releasing that's causing both male and females to go kind of crazy and expose themselves so that they can be eaten. It's the exposing themselves. That's mm -hmm. the, these worms yes. are hiding and they need them to come out of hiding. Mm -hmm. So the, the imperial cone snail exposes the fireworm to fake sex pheromones, coax them out of their hiding spot, which is usually in a coral reef, and then they are able to harpoon them and eat them. So this is what's weird, though, is they only saw this in a lab, and mature worms are only sexually active with the full moon. <laughs> so if you expose worms that are either immature or not sexually active, and it's not the full moon, there's no effect. So in laboratory experiments, they actually had to use artificial moonlight to elicit these responses from the worms related to the cone snail pheromones. So this is why the researchers say that there's okay. this, this asterisk on the study because the cone snails, they, they don't know exactly how they hunt in the wild. They haven't, haven't caught this in the wild yet. And how they can time it so well so that their compounds fit into this kind of temporal bucket of when it's actually useful to them. So The cone snail only hunts at night. Yes. <laughs> and only at the full moon? They only eat once a month? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so th there's a lot of unanswered questions here, but ultimately... Um, 80% of drugs that we currently use today are derived from small molecules. So the mm -hmm. fact that this release is a small molecule from the cone snail, they're kind of connecting dots that aren't quite there yet, but the expectation is that because cone snails have been used to create medicines in the past, this is kind of a Venn diagram, right? And so we're in the center here where we have the small molecules and we have the cone snails. So it's possible that in the center here, there's an opportunity for new drugs and medicines from this weirdo strategy from these cone snails. Right. So but the pher the pheromones? So using the small the small molecules that entice the worms? Yeah, so huh. it's 
So there's pheromones and there's, they have these two different molecules that they found. Yeah, right. And so I think, yeah, that's their next step is to figure out, is this strictly a pheromone? Is there something else going on in this mixture? Is it just creating this response because it's a pheromone or is it doing something else? Is there something else linked to this small molecule that we could utilize in other things? So I think it's it's um, it's not a straight line where they're going with this, but yeah, okay. Uh, but it's a it's a potential rich vein because it's coming from cone snails, which already are studied very well for their medicinal properties, but specifically the ones that eat fish. So this is the thing that's new about this: is these are some of the worm eating cone snails. So basically. It's making them re-examine how cone snails hunt and what chemicals they use to do it. Right. And maybe someday they will be able to, I don't know, do what they want with the worms because they have the molecules. Mm-hmm. That, you know, the scientist who controls the worms controls the world. Yes. Maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> um. Yeah, and next I have a study about fireflies or lightning bugs, which I'm um, enamored with, to say the least. This is a study out of Tel Aviv University, and uh, it was in collaboration with the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology, looking at um, how fireflies avoid being eaten by bats. This actually, the idea for the study came up accidentally. It's always a good start to a study, right? Um, a study that was, they were, they were tracking bats echolocation. They were wandering around a tropical forest with microphones and they detected kind of a weird, like low level sound in the background and they knew it wasn't a bat and it wasn't anything they recognized and they figured out it was fireflies. So then they explored this further. They looked at high speed video. Fireflies are producing a sound by moving their wings. And this is the thing that's crazy. The, the, the frequency of the sound meant that the fireflies couldn't hear it. So they were making a sound they could not hear. That's crazy. Okay, uh-huh. so they're producing this thing. Right. And what does it do? So why? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so fireflies are in this weird position with bats because they glow. So it's kind of like, Hey, I'm over here. (laughs) Um, and so they, they give away their position really easily. Um, but so they, they think that this is actually a way to kind of cloak themselves from bats that don't have good eyesight. (laughs) Through sound. It's like the, it's like the, the, the road noise. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that Ben was exactly. talking about. Yes. Yeah. So they examined three different species of fireflies that are common in Vietnam and one in Israel. They found that they all produce unique ultrasonic sounds that they cannot hear. They think that it is specifically a defense mechanism for bats because it was within a frequency that bats can hear. Messes with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, they have not proved that through tests yet so that's the kind of the not proven part of this what they have proved is fireflies make this background sound with their wings and they can't hear it but um they're they they do think that it points to this conclusion and they look forward to studying this in the future um the fact that they can't hear it themselves but bats can is kind of a dead ringer right um So it sounds like it's some sort of warning signal or it's confusing them. It's just background sound, one or the other. And um, there's, so yeah, so I guess that's kind of their two buckets of thought is either it's a warning signal because the fireflies to some species, the, the brightness is actually an, um, a warning signal. It's saying yeah. I'm poisonous because they are, right? So fireflies are nasty. Don't eat them. It's an aposematic signal. But um, the other kind of thought of this is that it is, in fact, part of the musical battle. So it it drowns out the bat's ability to echolocate. But they don't know that yet. So no. that's the next step next is to step. Get, do some sort of testing with bats and fireflies in a lab, I would guess. 
would be the next step. That's what I would do next. Yeah. Anyway, if you're listening. Now I want to know if there are other other like moth species that do something similar. Is is this because if this is a solution, a strategy to drown out the clicks of the bat, the echolocation of the bat, is this something that could have popped up multiple places and we just haven't seen it yet? And this is exactly why I brought this story because also humans hearing it's garbage. So how many species out there are making sounds we haven't even noticed because we haven't looked? Right. And how many species out there are making sounds that they themselves can't hear because it's beneficial to them? And then, of course, I have to ask myself, like, are they doing this subconsciously or is it part of a response to a potential threat? Like, so uh, could we be making sounds that we can't hear all the time? Oh, that's what tinnitus is. You're suddenly becoming aware of the high pitched yes. noise that you make yes. all the time. No, I'm kidding. That is not. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's, yeah. I just thought it was a fun kind of rabbit hole to think about how many animals out there are making sounds that we can't hear, but also that they can't hear. And it's actually for the benefit of another species. Seems crazy, but it's there. I, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we talk about ecological signals, mm-hmm. behavioral signals. Usually, they are things that the animals can That's perceive right. themselves, mm-hmm. and so this is out there. Like, what is that? Why are? You, how did that even evolve? If they don't even. Great question. Right. Seems pretty complicated <laughs> to evolve Super that when you can't hear it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, if it works, it works, right? That's just absolutely. That's just what it is. Yep. Oh my. Oh my goodness. Is that it for the animal corner? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Blair. You got it. Justin, do you want yeah. to tell a story? Sure. Uh yeah. So for decades now, there has been a mystery. Mystery, mystery, mystery. Something has been floating around the Norwegian Sea. Big blobs of biomorphic gelatinous spheres just sort of hover in the waters, hundreds of feet below the surface. They were first spotted by divers back in the 1980s. Eyewitness accounts have persisted over the years with no explanation of what these things are until now. Any guesses? No, but I mean, Good. dead plastic. dead jellyfish. Ooh, plastic, dead jellyfish. Mm, those are good guesses. Uh, international team of researchers uh, called upon citizen science to get the sample. Because these things are they're spotted, but they're spotted rarely. So they put out this, the word, if you see mysterious blobs floating in the Norwegian Sea, get a sample, send it to us. So that's what people did. They collected samples of this gooey, gelatinous blobs when they would see them, uh, put them in a jar, throw them in a refrigerator, and then wait for them to get picked up by the scientists. And it turns out that the mysterious blobs are, in fact, giant squid egg sacs. Well, they might not be giant. They're not giant squid. But they're, uh, the sacs are big. They're egg sacs. Whoa. They're egg sacs. Yeah. Uh... So the, the samples that they got contained squid embryos and also this gooey material that was sustaining them. It's a Ilexi, or Ilex coindedi, which is a type of squid common in the area. Researchers found that the embryos were all at different stages of development. So this was sort of a, a giant squid egg filled with thousands of these things. Uh, that were developing at different rates, and then they'd pop out, and then at some point, the blob itself would just dissolve, and the rest would go free into the into the sea. Yeah, a uh, a forty year old mystery has been solved. It's squid egg sack. Nobody, had, how did we not figure this out before? It, I mean, it seems like somebody could be like, let's scoop it up and look at what's inside the blob. Well, I, you know, I think it was if there's the waters off uh, the coast of Hawaii or San Diego, uh, maybe somewhere in the Mediterranean, we may have figured it out a long time ago. It takes a probably special breed to go diving in the Norwegian Sea. Uh, Fair enough. There's probably Pretty not good. as many as you might think. A bunch or, of polar bears. But still you know. more. Still more <laughs> than you might imagine. 
<laughs> are going under those waters. But those are like, look at this. Those photos you've got up are just crazy looking. They do look very alien. They look, they, they're, I mean, I could imagine if you were to see something like this floating, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to figure out exactly what it is. They look like. Yeah, it's some sort of bizarre jellyfish that's unlike any jellyfish you've ever seen. Cause it's got, so yeah. it's got this, that. That sphere of see-through gelatinous, whatever it is, like a bubble underwater. And then, I don't know, sea cucumber inside? That's <laughs> kind of what it looks like, yeah. <laughs> what is that? It's, I know the first time I saw by the wind sailors, you know, Valella, Valella. First time I saw those, I thought I, I thought it was an alien. I didn't know what to make of it. It's, you know, I can kind of picture seeing this and going, I... I just don't know. I just don't know. It doesn't seem to relate to any known life form that you'd be like, ah, that's a blah dee blah, blah or like uh, something or another. But no, uh, yeah, giant egg sac for baby squid. I love how every, like, you start looking at things on this planet, there are so many alien-looking things on our planet. Yeah. This planet... So many aliens on it. So next story is uh, our current modern world is being run more and more by uh, power of lithium ion batteries. Yes. And that is a problem. Yes. Well, it's still, you know, maybe better than the old days uh, when yes. we ran our, our technology on child labor, open <laughs> flames and petroleum infused hair cream. Right. Those were those were tough times. Uh, but there are issues. Lithium ion batteries. Potential fire hazards, performance loss at cold temperatures. There is uh, the environmental downside when you're trying to get rid of the old batteries. Enter Oleg Levin, professor in the Department of Electrochemistry at St. Petersburg University. He's been exploring some ways to improve the situation. And what they've done is they've synthesized a polymer based on the nickel saline complex. Nice saline. The molecules of this. Metal polymer act as a molecular wire to which energy-intensive nitroxyl pendants are attached. Molecular architecture of the material enables high capacitance performance to be achieved over a wide temperature range. Basically, what they did is they initially started playing with these uh, these new technologies to have connecting components to lithium ion batteries, but they since realized that they can maybe actually make an entire battery out of this material. That, based on what they've demonstrated thus far, has 10 times faster charging speed than a traditional lithium-ion battery. Which is pretty phenomenal if, you, uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, storage for just, yeah, charging your devices faster. That's cool. But you're also looking at then being able, able to charge faster from a solar panel array. Uh, you're out, able to grab more energy faster, basically. However, they, the, at the stage they're at now, it is still about 40% lower capacity uh, than a lithium-ion battery, which is already big and bulky and heavy uh, once you scale them up outside of your, your little device. So you still want the capacity to... Be st have storage there. That's the next step of this. But some of the some of the the upsides of it are that it uses less of the environmentally harmful things. They're not really going to ever catch fire. Uh, they have so they've got and they can work at those again at those those lower temperatures where if you if you have a solar array somewhere and you're using lithium ion batteries, once the temperature drops, I think just below zero your system shuts down. It'll stop trying to charge the battery. So if they can work at those sub-zero temperatures, that also opens up a lot more areas. Sounds like a nightmare battery to make economically. Yes, actually they use a lot less of the hard to find metals. So economically they might be cheaper in that regard. Uh, but again, you know, at the outset of any new technology, I'm responding to Rob Sherm in the chat room. At the outset of any new technology, of course, right? Everything is super expensive. The first dose of penicillin cost like $10 million. The first Prius that was on the road was like a 
$4 billion vehicle. But of course, they made more. They didn't stop at the one that they spent all the R&D on. They kept going. So uh, my last story tonight uh, is kind of interesting. They found ancient DNA from a Neanderthal. It's about a 50,000-year-old uh, uh, Neanderthal in Chechia. I guess it's the Czech Republic somewhere. Uh, sort of interesting yeah. thing about this is that it had... It was a Neanderthal that had interbred with humans at some point. And it wasn't the humans that we think of being introduced to Europe about 40,000 years ago. Or the Near East, 40,000 years ago. This is more... This is humans that, that we have, since last year, discovered uh, were already in Europe before this human migration. So this is the oldest current modern human DNA that we have. This is the oldest representative that we have is in this Neanderthal. And it's not related to any of the Europeans of today. So this was, this was a, a colonization of Europe by current modern humans that for some reason failed. Because they aren't represented anywhere in the genetic history now. Huh. But here it is, preserved in Neanderthal remains. Uh, and I think this Neanderthal was about 2,000 years removed. So while, while we all have uh, anybody, uh, people who are not of African direct descent usually have between 2 to 3% Neanderthal DNA somewhere in them from a you know, 30, 40,000 year intermingling event that took place at some sort of bottleneck or, or multiple bottlenecking points when, as the current modern humans moved into. Europe. But this group was already there and had already been intermingling. And it was only 2,000 removed. This Neanderthal was only 2,000 years removed from a human intermingling event. Uh, and is showing us a great glimpse of current early modern human <laughs> DNA of a branch that had uh, colonized Europe and failed to remain there. That's I mean, we already know this is like, surprise, humans and Neanderthals intermingled. But this is like extra surprise. It happened longer ago than we expected and probably more and times. It's a completely different group. With of, a different group. Yeah. Of current modern humans than the ones that are persisting now in Europe, which is also fascinating. Yeah. Group of, group of old modern humans that died out. Yeah. So when <laughs> they didn't when, make it. When yeah. the current, current modern humans of Europe arrived in Europe and were making their way to Europe and intermingling with Neanderthals, it might have been their first time seeing a Neanderthal. But the Neanderthals were like, oh, yeah. We've seen we you 2,000 years ago. God. Where are you I know from? what these guys like. Yeah. <sighs> I think, yeah, it's not the question. Yeah, it's not the question all, of blah, blah, blah. whether Neanderthals and humans intermingled. Now it's. How often, where, when, how far back did it go? Um, yeah. Been this I'm, been... also, I'm also fascinated that this is our earliest uh, uh, DNA sample yeah. of a current modern human. I thought we might have had older than that, but uh, apparently this is it. In the, in the housed within the Neanderthal is our best glimpse into... 45,000 years ago in the, the caves of the Czech Republic. The, the, the uh, early human, uh, the early European, not European now, peoples. I don't even know what to call them. Proto-Europeans? Mm -hmm. Juxta-Europeans? Proto-Juxtas? I don't know. Two-legged buddies. <laughs> Europe's first humans? Early humans? Yeah. We can call them all sorts of names, but you know what? They were all just human people. They were all the family. They were all, fa they're all, they're all family. That's right. Invite them to Thanksgiving. Everyone, thank you so much for watching This Week in Science. I have a couple of stories, so I'd love to dive into those before we, before we go. First, raindrops. The rain in Spain falls mainly the same on other Earth-like planets, regardless of air density, according to a new study <laughs> looking at the physics of raindrops. Good. 
Yeah. Now say that again. <laughs> exactly. It just rolls off the tongue. Oh, and by the way, apparently raindrops don't look like raindrops. Wait, what? Yes. Uh, these, these researchers uh, in, in the paper, they specify that, they're, that raindrops do not look like the raindrops that we characterize as raindrops. They are oblate spheroids and that that shape as the uh, air density changes or the speed of the drops plummeting toward the ground from the clouds, it may squash them until they look kind of like uh, the top of a hamburger bun. Oh. But they don't look like raindrops. You know, I mean, nice, honestly, roundy, why would they? Twisty, if you think yeah. about that, they, like yeah. a teardrop shape, right? Why would the they? Shape. They don't look like that. <laughs> That's not a raindrop, apparently. Thanks, physics. Oh, hang on, hang on. I, sorry, I have to correct something from my previous story really quick. Mm. Grav Sharma is pointing out, Chechia is the new name of the Czech Republic, not a city in the Czech Republic. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm still getting the new maps. I'm still getting the new maps downloaded. I have a really He's still working on internet. a map from like the 1970s. Don't worry about him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was a great correction. Thank you, Grav. Thank you, Gaurav. Yeah, so these researchers uh, from the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences looked at the physics of raindrops to find out if raindrops are, well, if, they, if they'll be like raindrops on other planets. And so they looked at certain aspects of, uh, of rainfall, of raindrops, things that affect raindrop shape and how they evaporate because if they can model how rain happens on other planets they may be able to get better climate models here on our own planet but also help us understand the atmospheres of other planets in our solar system and on exoplanets elsewhere where water and not water other other volatiles may be detected that's what i was just going to ask if it would yeah. if other substances would act the same way yeah, and, so and, say if you were on Titan, the rain would fall the same as the rain on Earth, except it would not be water, it would be methane. Uh. <laughs> I was going to say, if we can find the planet that the raindrops actually look teardrop, then we know the artist that first started making that teardrop is, is from there. That's, That's where, where they're, they're from. from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so they were looking at the key question, whether or not the raindrop makes it to the surface of the planet as rain. Uh, water in the atmosphere is really essential to planetary climate. And so size matters when it comes to raindrops. If they're too big, the raindrop is going to bust apart if there's not enough surface tension to hold it together. If the surface tension can't can't hold on anymore and and this is the same whether or not it's water, methane, or liquid iron on, an, on exoplanets raining from the sky. And so they were looking at drop shape, falling speed, and evap evaporation speed and modeled what raindrops would be like on multiple planets. And Earth-like planets are going to have rain like Earth. Mm. It doesn't matter. Air density doesn't matter. But um, mm. yeah, rain is rain is rain. Wherever Man, next time it rains, I'm going to picture little hamburger buns. You should imagine hamburger buns falling from the sky when you look up at the rain. But it's <laughs> the top on. bun. You're saying it's the top bun. So it's it's spherical top on bun. top and it's kind of squished at the bottom because of the downward force. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. See, yeah. I would have actually pictured them to look exactly like hail. Like whatever hail looks like. Is how like I would rocks expect falling from the sky. Well, it's like yeah, frozen it's raindrops, spears, right? Yeah, they're, but they are kind of they are they're not perfectly round though. They are they do have like a. I'm gonna have to look closer next time I see hail. They have a flat take a quick side, look before say. it before it melts. Yeah, yeah. But the things that we learn about raindrops. Thank you, physicists, for doing this modeling. And then I would like to take it from raindrops to tits we talked about beavers oh. now i need to talk about great tits okay. good researchers looking at 
the great the uh what is the <laughs> scientific name of the what is it paris i don't remember though but the great tit there are researchers in the max planck institute for animal behavior and the university of constance in germany were looking at these birds and their ability to change behaviors they trained a bunch of birds on little puzzle boxes and they found that different birds came up with different solutions for how to get food out of these puzzle boxes. The, what they've found over time is that there is a change in populations to the strategies for solving these puzzle, puzzle boxes. And they wanted to know where that change was coming from. Is it coming from innovation within the group of birds or does immigration from other birds coming mm. into their population have anything to do with the way that their cultural knowledge changes. So they got these resident birds to get trained up on these puzzle boxes. And then as the birds l learned different ways, had different ways of solving the puzzle, they then started bringing new birds into the situation, immigrants. And the resident population had kind of fixed on one pretty good way of solving the puzzle, but it wasn't the most efficient. There were innovators within the population of birds that started finding more innovative, efficient ways to get food out of the puzzle boxes, but the resident population was like stuck in its ways and wouldn't adopt the new methods. However, when the immigrant birds came in, they were more likely to adopt the more efficient methods. And when they adopted the easier, better way of getting food, the other birds in the population followed suit. They and so learn. immigrants, yeah, these birds were learning from each other. And the birds that were coming in from elsewhere, immigrating in, they, they learned. They got the job done. But they didn't learn the inefficient way to do it. They learned the better way to do it, the more efficient way. So It's almost like having an outside point of view. <laughs> Gives a more yeah. whole picture of what's going yeah. on in a space. Yeah. You could be more objective. Potentially. Yes. I don't know. I thought it was really fascinating, this idea that there are, you know, when birds become residents in an area, they don't have to innovate as much or they do innovate, but they don't. They're like, meh, I've got this way. It works really well. I'm fine. I don't need to try. I don't need to pick up this new efficient way. I'm fine doing the old thing. I like my habits. But then when the newbies come in, they're like, oh, hey, why are you doing that? This one, that, that looks good. I'm going to take that one. They look, at, they look at all the potential options, and they don't have habits yet. So they're more likely to pick up on something new. Mm -hmm. And they can change the whole population's behavior as a result. Yeah. Birds cool. have cultural knowledge. Yeah, this and so diversity of opinion and knowledge and, is important. Yeah, and listening to voices from the outside, sometimes yeah. you need to change what you're doing and fix it up. Yeah. We can take some lessons from these. Paris Major, that's the species name for the great Oh, that's tit. cool. Paris, Paris Major. That's a good one. Yeah, and they're very pretty birds also. They are yellow with white cheeks and they got gray and they're they're beautiful we don't have them here in north america but they are mm. uh all over europe if you ever hear me talking about great tits on this show these birds are what i'm talking about yeah they are yes. great they are great they're fantastic so, some might even call them major are we doing euphemism i always get lost in the middle of this <sighs> segment <laughs> no i'm doing science i have a couple more stories really fast to get through before we get to the very end here one, I just wanted to bring up because I thought it was like, uh, it's so thought provoking. And it's just an interesting, after thinking about this cultural adaptation and, and learning within this bird species, thinking about how culture changes and how we can do things better. I found another story uh, where researchers, a researcher at Boston University uses Mario Kart to teach about uh, the about economics and capitalism to his classes. And he's written a paper about how this Nintendo racing game can teach us all important lessons 
for social and economic benefits for the entire world, specifically for the world's developing re regions. His uh, thesis is that Mario Kart is a game which gives boosts to those in the back of the pack. It increases opportunity for those in the back of the pack to be able to make it closer to the front. Even though those in the front might have banana peels that they can throw out to trip people up behind them, those in the back are always kind of kept in the game. So the race never feels like it's totally lost and everybody remains a player. And so his idea is that if we were to learn how to give economic opportunity and benefits to those in the lowest social sta socioeconomic statuses, specifically in developing countries, to let them oh, boost yeah. up, to help them, you know, potentially they could become big. But, you know, regardless, keep them in the game. Farmers in rural India who might be really struggling because of drought or other, uh, other cultural or environmental situations, find ways to keep them in the game, keep them in the race. How many other gaming concepts can we use to better humanity? This is my so question. This is also, though, if I may, this is a compliment to the designers of Mario Kart. Yes, Because it is. this is exactly why <laughs> I've had conversations about this with people before. Mario Kart is a superior racing game to other games. And this is exactly why. Because you are never out of the running. Yep. So it's almost impossible to get fully lapped more than maybe once if you're at the very back because of they ha they have found a way to equalize things. And I think, yeah, the like Nintendo accidentally <laughs> created a game that made you want to continue playing and get better mm -hmm. at it and learn because you never felt fully defeated. Right. You're, you and think kids that's why, can play you, it with you, adults. It's like, yeah. Or do you yeah. think it's because they realize like, okay, this is going to go into household where the kids might be two, three, or four years apart in age. So we need a way to make it so they both want to play the game still. Right? The Man, little kids... I've played so many racing games and none of them do this as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, really. that's what I'm saying. That's that's smart. Because they, they realize there's an age gap, probably, at home between the players of siblings who are going to be separate. So there's going to be one with a lot more ability to get it and just be, like, figured out and play hard and try to beat up their younger sibling. And the younger sibling can, like, they're like, ah, I'm messing up, but, uh, oh, I found one of these cool things that's going to help me along a little bit. Yeah. Perfect, a little equalizer. You know, you Makes say sense. it's age. It's not always age. Sometimes, you know, there's just yeah. different abilities for video games amongst people. Did you have a younger sibling that used to beat you at video games? Is this what you're trying no. to say? No, okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's not always the case. <laughs> well, anyway. I hope that, you know, we can leave people with some interesting thoughts about video games and how they can give us lessons to better the world how mario kart will help us design a better future for you for humanity I like, it. I like it but before we go i do need to tell people about brain glue brain glue researchers have developed a compound uh you were talking earlier about the gold nanopore um tattoos that in that use hydrogel to be able to uh incorporate all the components this does something similar. These researchers um, at UGA's Regenerative Biosciences Center, they have created a hydrogel which contains a lot of the proteins that um, are should be released by the astrocytes and the support cells in the brain in the case of injury. But in the case of traumatic brain injury, there's such extensive damage and tissue loss those cells that are the support cells aren't really there to do the fixing. And so these researchers have uh, created, and they've published it in Science Advances, they have created this brain glue that can be implanted so far only into animals that have a model of traumatic brain injury. Uh, and they were able to see that by mimicking the structure and the function of the sugars that support the brain cells, that it was able to bind to 
fibroblast growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, two protective protein factors that enhance survival and regrowth of brain cells after traumatic brain injury. When they um, implanted this hydrogel into mouse brains, they discovered that the protective factor, uh, the protective factors accelerated regeneration of brain tissue, accelerated recovery from, in, from injury in the animals. Uh, they had repair of damaged brain tissue, and uh, so they recovered more quickly. So potentially, this is just in animals so far, but potentially they'll be able to uh, translate this to people. So people who are injured in car accidents or uh, during battle, uh, this would be great for um, for people in the military potentially, or anyone who suffers traumatic brain injury, that it could help the brain fix itself, which is what the brain needs. The brain makes you. You make your brain. So what if let's I've get had some brain glue? What if I've had slow, over a long period of time, brain damage? It's just been incremental. Not the same. Not the same. Incremental. But but if you add it up, <laughs> the sum total <laughs> is like not unlike a traumatic brain injury, but it's been done very slowly over a long period of time. Does this kind of thing help? I don't know. I'm not sure, but maybe they will test it. I mean, okay. yeah. I'd like to try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody needs some brain glue in their lives. I hope that this show has been brain glue for many of you, making new connections and sticking parts of your brain together, reconnecting, making, making sparks fly. Mm, yeah. Electrochemical sparks. To be sure. Okay. I think we've done it finally. We've reached the end of the show, right? Oh, is it the end? We've done it. We have no announcements? Or did I miss it? We do have an announcement. Yes, everyone. Ooh, it's coming up very quickly now. Don't forget about the twist. DTNS crossover. April 17th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. It's going to be the science tech crossover show of the century. Well, maybe not this, maybe the month, year. You don't miss it. Make sure it's on your calendar. We'll have a link for you soon. You better not miss it. Favorite science show, your favorite tech show, all smushed up into one. Look at all mushy. Science and tech mushy mush crossover. It's going to be great. If you have topics you would like us to discuss with the DTNS crew, send us an email. Let us know. We'll put it on the list. See if we can get to it. I do want to say thank you to Ben Goldfarb for his interview on this International Beaver Day. Wonderful day of beavers and a great interview on the subject. Thank you, Fada, for help with social media and show notes. Thank you, Gord, for your work in the chat room. Thank you, Identity4, for, for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for your assistance. Who? <laughs> Justin! Uh. <laughs> and I really, really do want to say thank you to our Patreon sponsors, without whom we really would not be able to keep this show going. Thank you to Carl Kornfeld, Jen Myronuk, Melanie Stegman, Dak Kramsta, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffingarv, Sharma Shubru, Darwin Hannon, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke Paul, Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Date, Jason Old, Steve Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support. And if 
any of you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, please click that Patreon link over at twist.org on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook headquarters. Also from twist.org slash live. Of course. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. Yeah. Oh, or you can, uh, for more information, you can go on anything you heard here today. Show notes and links to our stories will be available on the website www.twist.org where you can also sign up for our newsletter and if you want to talk to us directly you can email kirsten at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com justin at twistmanina at gmail.com or me blair at blairbaz at twist.org just be sure to put twist t-w-i-s at the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into the inside of a beaver dam oh we'll never that get would it be back. fun Mm-mm, no yeah. little kits playing material Yep. Uh, and you can also gnaw on our stumps at at twist on Twitter at at twist science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science, science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 
This Week in Science. This Week in Science.